uh, Distinguished Darwin Series. Uh, I'm Victoria Sork, and I welcomed you to many of these last year, and I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm <coughs> delighted to have you back to this thing. And I'm happy to say, as Dean of Life Sciences at UCLA, we're particularly happy that we can honor Darwin for the second year in a row. As you know, the last year's reason for having a series of talks, which you probably saw a series of talks all over the country, all over the world actually, uh, was to celebrate the 200th anniversary of, of Darwin's birth. This year, we want to do is celebrate the 150th anniversary um, of Darwin's first book. So, the origin of species. So we want to celebrate this milestone event. The Life Sciences is delighted to have this series continue. I'm delighted that so many of you come back, or, or come back and you're telling your friends. Um, some of you even, uh, some of you got distracted, I know, and wanted to go off and, and join the, uh, the cheers on the other side of campus. So we're delighted that you uh, overcame that temptation and, and came here today uh, for what I think is going to be uh, an amazing uh, lecture by one of our uh, eminent faculty members. So I also want to do is acknowledge that we have had several anonymous donors that helped subsidize um, this series and like all of UCLA's uh, events, we're always happy to have the Friends of UCLA help us put on these, um, these uh, activities. So I'm going to now introduce Dan Bloomstein, who is going to, who's uh, acting chair of the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and he will be the one introducing the speaker. So thank you for coming. So before I get started, I'd like to personally thank you for um, coming to our first talk in our second year of our Darwin Evolving series. If you've been here before, we hope you've enjoyed them. If you haven't, we hope you enjoy this and our other talks this year. Now, it's never um, really been more important to understand the diversity of life, and we at UCLA's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology provide a vital role in discovering nature. So tonight, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce my colleague, Blair von Valkenburg, as tonight's Darwin Evolving Lecture. Blair is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology, is a renowned paleontologist and carnivore specialist, and is truly a distinguished naturalist. Blair received her PhD from the Johns Hopkins University on a topic that she continues to study, the evolution of form and function and ecology of organisms. She was a previous departmental chair and, is current, and currently serves as the president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Blair studies living species to understand extinct species. Her work brings alive the behavior of extinct species, species we care about. She focuses on the biology of large, fierce predators. And her work sheds light on what it was like here in Los Angeles many, many years ago. Um, she's done a lot with the animals of the La Brea Tar Pits. Blair's work is characterized by the application of cutting edge technology. She uses CT scans and finite element analysis to build complex three-dimensional models and interpret function and design constraints. Blair is not only a valued colleague, um, she's an award-winning teacher. Um, she's won our university's highest teaching award, um, the UCLA University Distinguished Teaching Award, as well as teaching awards within our department. She's an honorary fellow of the California Academy of Sciences. She works at museums to develop effective educational exhibits, and she's been a scientific advisor and televised speaker on a number of really good um, natural history documentaries. I hope you all enjoy Blair's work as much as we do, and so please join me in welcoming Professor Blair von Valkenburg, um, who will share with us the natural history of saber-toothed cats. Hold on for a minute here. Sorry, should I have this on before? There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Dan, for that nice, wonderful introduction. So tonight, my goal is to teach you something about saber-toothed cats, of course, but also, I hope, along the way, illustrate some of the ways that paleontologists um, extract information from fossils, which is a somewhat difficult task. So because we're thinking about Darwin, next Tuesday is the anniversary of the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin. When Darwin published that book, there were perhaps only three saber-toothed cats known at that time. And Darwin did not include them in his book anywhere. I searched hard and long for to find it, but no, couldn't find it. Um, and at the time when Darwin, in 1859, at that time, the ways, the tools we had to study fossils were really rulers and calipers 
and that's about it, right? And it was pretty much that way for at least 100 years. And then we had significant advances in various things in the latter half of the 20th century, such as computing technology and molecular biology and biochemistry and studies of animal behavior. All of this has enriched the study of fossils tremendously. So let me show you just some examples of that kind of work, of these kinds of advances, what we can do now. For example, we can now um, use isotopes to figure out what fossil animals eat. So when an animal eats something, isotopes of nitrogen and carbon that are in the prey animals, for example, or in the grasses, in the case of herbivores, of what they're eating and the plants that they're eating, are incorporated into their growing bones and their modifying bones and teeth. And so by looking at the relative amount of nitrogen and carbon, you get, you see different signatures for different herbivores. And these are um, Pleistocene herbivores, perhaps 30,000 years old from Alaska. And here's bison and horse and caribou and musk ox in this space here. And these little circles here are wolves, contemporaneous wolves from the same time. So what we can read from this is that wolves were not specializing on horses or caribou or musk ox, and rarely, if ever, ate musk ox, it looks like. But they were um, having a mixed diet, basically, of horse, bison, and caribou. So this is a really powerful tool, and it has been used on saber-toothed cats, which I'll mention later. Um, ancient DNA, of course, is amazing. It allows us to look at the relationships among organisms long extinct, at least as much as back 50,000 years or so for sure, and look at population level relationships as well as species relationships. And this is just an example of gray wolves, again from the same Pleistocene study. These gray wolves down here that are forming a cluster are the Alaskan Pleistocene gray wolves, and most all of these are modern wolves. So it's clear from this we found that we had a sort of unique, perhaps subspecies living in Alaska 40,000 years ago. Now, as he mentioned, we do things with CAT scans now. The CAT scan was invented in 1975, and that was a huge um, thing for paleontology. I think we didn't start really using it until the 80s or so, but um, it allows you to take scans of a skull or any object, right? And it takes slices, basically, x-rays and slices. And so here you see three different slices. And then you can stack those slices together in the computer, because it's a digital uh, technology, and build yourself a model of a skull in a computer that you can rotate and play with however you want to. And what we, one of the things that we did, which um, Dan also mentioned is important, is they're used to build uh, these things called finite element analysis model, finite element models of, uh, that we use to estimate strength in skulls. So this is tools of engineering directly taken from engineers. These are the tools they use to estimate strength in bridges and buildings and airplanes and decide when they need to strengthen an area or weaken an area or how it will react to given loads. We can do the same thing with skulls now and compare skulls. And here is a preliminary finite element model of the famous Smilodon saber-toothed cat from La Brea. And what you're seeing here in the colors is the amount of strain that's being felt or uh, loaded over the skull when it's biting with, two can with both canines directly into something. So it's being loaded in this way. Blue means very low strain. And warm colors like red mean very high strain. And green is sort of in between. So you can use this if you compare cats of different types. You can see how the skulls are designed with sand loads of different types or designed for the loads that they expect to, um, to experience. We also, what's the beauty of CAT scans is, and skulls, is that you can now look inside skulls into all the nooks and crannies and holes and interesting things that are inside skulls, like olfactory turbinates and interesting things like that because it's taking an entire scan of the skull. And as you watch here, I'm going to make the skull starting at the nose open up in front of you, I hope. There we go. So there you can see that's some of the turbinate area and the lower jaw and teeth. And then we come back, and there's interesting sinuses up top, and that's the brain case, that big opening. And what's really fun is then we're now coming to the ears, these right here. And if, I, if I'm good, I can stop it when we get to the cochlea, if those of you that know the middle ear. So you can actually get measurements and quantify aspects of internal skull structure that we could never do before without destroying skulls entirely. And generally, um, museum curators are not, do not like that. <laughs> so you can't do it, basically. OK, and then finally, there's just been a huge amount of information coming from field studies of animal behavior, as well as laboratory studies, about how animals use their teeth, 
how they use their bones for running, for climbing, for killing, for fighting. All that kind of information is extremely useful for paleontologists because we have to infer everything about these animals' behavior from the bones and teeth alone. So when we get direct inferences from the living, we can apply it to the past, which is a lot of what I'm going to do in this talk. Um, so here's the sort of outline of what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about what are saber-toothed cats, when and where did they exist, how do they differ from living cats, how and what did they kill, and were they finally, were they social or solitary cats? Okay, what's a saber-toothed cat? Okay, this one, and most of you know, <laughs> this is Diego. Diego is a saber-toothed cat. However, there's another unusual creature, creature up there. So that's a saber tooth, that thing. That's a saber tooth squirrel. That is not a saber tooth cat, and nothing like it ever existed. So, <laughs> and why it would have saber teeth is a mystery, but we'll come to that. Yeah. OK, another famous, I have to say, point this out to you, that the state fossil of California is, since 1973, a Smilodon fatalis, here shown next to the new seal for the state of California. Um, it's being promoted. OK, so <laughs> I especially like this, California. Yeah. <laughs> so, OK, <laughs> so everyone knows about Smilodon. Smilodon is by far and wide the most famous saber-toothed cat there is. And I imagine that many of you in the audience, if, um, if not most of you, think that that's the only saber-toothed cat that ever existed. And that is far from the truth, which is my first important point that I want to make. OK, here's a map showing the distribution of saber-toothed cats over their history, which is the past 40 million years. And the important thing is that saber-toothed cats were the typical large cat nearly everywhere for most of the past 40 million years. The kind of cats we have today, which have canine teeth that are relatively round in cross-section, only took over in the sort of past 5 million years for this large body size thing. So you could have gone almost anywhere except Greenland or Antarctica or Australia and found a saber-toothed form um, at some point in the history of these continents. So they were very, um, they were the cat. There are over probably about 50 species of saber-toothed cats described. Now where do they fit in the family tree? Well, it's a little complicated and this is kind of a goofy diagram. But here's the carnivore family tree, and this is a tree, and that you can split this tree basically in two major branches. This side on the bluish side over here is the dog-like carnivores, and that's dogs and raccoons and bears, weasels, otters, and seals, sea lions, walruses, all of those things. And then the other side is the cat-like carnivores, we call them. And if you look on this side, you see that we have the family Felidae, which are the modern cats that we have today. But we also have an extinct group of cats called the Nimravidae, which are, in quote, cats, because in technically, the name cat should only belong to things in the family Felidae, but they're so cat-like and for years were thought to be members of the family Felidae that we still call them Nimravid cats half the time. Also on this side of the tree are things like hyenas, civets, and mongooses. But what you can see from this is illustrating is that the independent evolution of this saber-toothed type of morphology at least twice in the, in, in the carnivore tree. So something is selecting for this kind of form. And, in fact, here, it even evolved outside the order carnivora. So here in this slide, again, you see the Nimravids. This is sort of a sampling of saber-toothed cats of various sorts and cat-like things. So here are the Nimravids. They existed from 40 to 20 million years, 21 million years ago, approximately. They were the first saber-toothed cats, really, on the um, planet. And there's a sampling of a few of their skulls. Here are cat, true cat saber-tooths, a sampling of their skulls. And here's some really interesting things. Here's a marsupial in South America. Actually, a, a marsupial saber-toothed cat evolved. It's a bit bizarre looking, but it's definitely a saber-toothed cat-like form. This is the earliest known saber-toothed form. It's a member of an extinct group of carnivores called uh, carnivorous mammals, I should say, called creodonts, so outside the order carnivora. So that's another independent evolution. We know this, this drawing isn't very expressive of the <laughs> saberous tooth, but this flange here gives away the fact that there was a saber tooth there. And we have better fossils. I just couldn't find a better drawing that has a whole head. Um, and then this strange form, Barbara Felis, used to be put in the Nimravids, but some people have pulled this out as yet another independent evolution of saber tooth forms. So, Clearly, this is not, saber tooths are not a freak of nature that only existed in Los Angeles at La Brea Tar Pits recently. Um, 
this is a very dominant form. These were large carnivores, so they were major players in their ecosystem. So understanding what they did and how they killed is, is important. It has relevance to rebuilding past life. Okay, the other cool thing about this, which you probably noticed, is there's really a strong overall similarity of form of these skulls. They all have similar sort of profiles. Of course, they have the long teeth, but there's a strong overall similarity despite the fact that they've evolved independently. So this is a classic example of what we call convergent evolution, or the independent evolution of similar forms in different locations or different times due to the action of similar selection pressures. And Darwin, since we have to speak, bring up, we should always bring up Darwin this week and next week, um, discussed convergent evolution in the origin of species, although he called it something like analogous resemblance. Um, and he said, well, this is a portion of what he said, Darwin's very wordy, so I just took a little bit. Animals belonging to two most distinct lines of descent may have become adapted to similar conditions and thus have assumed, uh, assumed a close external resemblance. So it's really nice evidence of the action of natural selection working repeatedly to produce similar forms. He did not use, as I said, saber tooths as an example. His, his example, the one of the examples he brought up, was a similarity between the gray wolf, a placental mammal that lives in the whole Arctic regions, and the Tasmanian wolf of Australia. So a nice example of close convergence. Okay. All right, so how, how did they differ from living cats, these saber tooths, besides having long canines, obviously? Okay, both of them have um, knife-like elongate upper canines. They also have enlarged anteriorly placed incisors. And if I don't mention it later, you can see this is a felid on this side. I should mention that. That's a clouded leopard, a living cat. And this is, of course, Smilodon. And you notice these are farther in front of the canine. And this is clearly part of their killing apparatus, but it's also their feeding apparatus. People sometimes wonder how these animals were able to ingest their prey because they'd have to open their mouth so wide every time to take a bite to get free the canines, but they wouldn't. They could use just these incisors that are out in front, kind of like in the movie Alien, you know, <laughs> that could nibble away at, you know, could take sizable chunks out of things. Um, right. They also have, and we're going to dwell on this little anatomical portion a little bit, they have a reduced coronoid process. So this is the lower jaw, right? And there's this handle that comes up here. Here's the jaw joint. And this is rather large in the typical cat. It's actually a lever arm for the jaw-closing muscle. In the, in the Smilodon, it's quite, in all saber-toothed cats, it's greatly reduced. Um, I'll explain why that is. And, um, they also have larger attachment sites for head-depressing muscles. And I'll explain why all these things evolved. So these are muscles that are coming off the neck and are inserting on the bottom of the skull and pulling the skull downwards. And they have sort of a different skull shape. This is very domed, and this is sort of less so, and I'll discuss how it's different in a minute. Okay, in saber tooth, a lot of these changes that I'm talking about have to do with the basic problem of having these really long canine teeth and being able to open your mouth wide enough to free the canine teeth from the lower canine teeth so you have something you can bite with and at the same time maintain the ability to close your jaws with some force once you've done that. So if we look at this problem, so here's a mountain lion, which is a modern cat. Here's a Nimravid saber tooth, and here's one of those weird Barbara Felid saber tooths. And what they've done in this illustration is open, swung the jaws open 65 degrees in each case. And if we look at the size of the ball, that they can get. You can see that the mountain lion does much better than these. So clearly if a saber tooth wants to be able to really open its jaws wide like a modern cat, it's going to have to um, do something to allow that to happen. And you could say, well, maybe they should just open them wider, but the problem really is, is that they can't do it without stretching the jaw muscles, which is what we'll come to next. So the problem is, when um, the jaws open, when the jaws open, the muscles will get stretched, and I'll show you that. And muscles, when they're stretched, um, do not function as well. When they're stretched to more than about 1.2 time, times their resting length, they lose a lot of their ability to close the jaws again, to produce force. So muscles aren't like rubber bands. It's not like when you pull on a muscle, it gets tauter and tauter, it'll snap back harder. In fact, it gets worse and will snap back less. So they work best close to their resting length in general. 
So here's where the major jaw closing muscle sits on this clouded leopard. It's called the temporalis muscle. And it inserts on the coronoid process. And you can see how this makes like a lever arm. Here's the center of rotation for the jaw joint. So this is pulling backwards and closing the jaw. But when the jaw opens, this point of the coronoid will move around this arc and stretch that fiber. So the wider you open the jaws, the greater the stretch. So saber tooths have tried to resolve this issue. But here, oops, I got another demonstration. So here's how muscles get stretched. There's that one temporalis fiber. Now as the jaw would open, it would move that far on the arc, and then it would move that far on the arc, to make that clear, as the jaw would be swinging through that row, a circle. What saber tooths have done is they've reduced the size of the coronoid process and made it come much closer to the jaw joint, so the whole thing is moving on a smaller circle. So what you're seeing here is the same diagram again, 65 degrees of opening. And this is at 65 degrees of opening, the blue is the resting length of the muscle, and the blue plus the red is the stretched length of the muscle. So this is almost twice, so it probably isn't functioning that well, but these are just schematics. You really should look at this as just relative. In an Imravid doing the same thing, it's only 1.3, and in the Barbarophila, it's only 1.2. So this reduction in the coronoid process enhances their ability to open their jaws wide and still close them with some force. And that's why we see it evolve repeatedly in, in saber tooth forms. Now, there's a trade-off here, though, that you probably, I think some of you may be thinking about. I mentioned that this is a lever arm, this coronary process, because here's the center rotation, and this is kind of a little lever arm for closing the jaw. And if you make this closer to the jaw joint, you're reducing your leverage. So they've lost a lot of leverage of the jaw muscle. So for many people would say, oh, they have weak bites. And that was sort of what people thought um, for some time. But then more detailed studies of their anatomy based on the bottoms of their skulls showed that they had recruited other muscles to help the temporalis. So what they've done is they've recruited these muscles back here that are coming off the neck and pulling downwards and rotating the skull about the fulcrum. So most cats and most mammals in general, when you chew or you bite, it's simply an up-down motion of your jaw. You don't pull your cranium down to your jaw. You just pull up-down with the jaw. saber tooths instead, have now added this added component where they can um, pull down. So I can even make it go, ooh, look at that, my movie. <laughs> <laughs> Scary, huh? Yeah. OK, so the African lion has this really big lever over there, and that's why that's there to show you that. OK, so we don't really think they've lost um, by force. And not only for that reason, but I could give you many other reasons, but we don't have time. <laughs> yeah. OK, the next thing I want to talk about is this um, uh, face shape profile change. Um, and this is, again, a consequence of the need for a large gape, is that if you look at the re relative relationship of the face to sort of the brain case back here, this is tilted upwards relative to the situation here. So I'll put some lines on there. There's the sort of base, uh, we call it the base of cranium, the sort of base of the skull. And there's the face line. And you see the dramatic angle between in Smilodon versus the clouded leopard. So in saber toothed cats, they've rotated the face upwards in an evolutionary sense on, on the back of the skull. Um, this is an adaptation. It, we actually see this nicely increase in lineages of saber tooths as the canines get longer. So it's very obviously an adaptation to increasing, need for increasing gape. And I can show you this shape change better using a technique uh, that we call geometric morphometrics. So here's a little something fun. OK, so in this technique, what we do is we take a lateral, say, a digital a photograph of a skull, digital photograph of a skull. And then we mark landmarks around the skull, points that we can recognize the same points on a series of cat skulls in this sense. And the computer then produces a simple outline, these little black things over here, of connecting the dots. So we produce a simple outline of, say, that skull. And we do the same for a variety of species. And then the computer <laughs> um, figures out what we have to do, what deformation we have to do to make this skull, to move this skull into that shape. So what it's showing, let's say, down here is you see this skull is quite domed. So the deformation grid is bent downwards. And what it's showing here is more what I'm talking about in the saber tooth. It's showing the skull being bent upwards. That's the face in the front there. So now let's look at this makes a nice way of sort of visualizing the whole change. Here's a really pretty series um, from these are cat, true cat um, saber tooths, because they're smilodon 
to smile it on there. And there's their time when they existed. We see this tendency to get progressively longer canines. And now here we have a straight grid, so we're comparing these three to that. And I think you can see this progressive pinching upward of the skull uh, over evolutionary time. It's really quite nice. And what's great is talk about convergence, is now if we look at three different lineages, the nimravids, those weird barbarophilids, and the machairodonts, this guy is just here to remind you that this is the front of the skull, and that's the orientation, you can see the same pattern happening, starts and bends a little and bends a lot more. And if I could have mapped the canine tooth length on it as you had in the last picture, you would have seen that these forms with the greatest upward bent had the longest canines. So it's really remarkable convergence. And it's a kind of a great example of where independent lineages, uh, lineages are following the same exact, very close, very similar morphological trajectory, probably because there are really very few ways to solve this problem of increasing gape with large canines. So they can't, you don't see multiple solutions to the same problem. This is what happens. Okay, now some fun. How and what did they kill? All right, let's think about what they are. I'm not, I'm just going to, I haven't said much about their skeletons, their postcrania, but let's, I'll give you the brief run through here. They have massively built, uh, they're massively built big cats. They're like cats on steroids. Their bones tend to be thicker and uh, uh, shorter distally. They're very um, powerful cats. They have very long, strong necks. They have extremely, they're more powerful in the front than they are in the back. They're like, built like wrestlers, big, powerful forelimbs. They have retractile claws like all cats, and they also have very short backs and tails, which also is a signature of a strength um, for wrestling with um, large prey. So this is combined with a dentition that screams carnivory, right? It has nothing, they have nothing but meat-eating teeth, and a skull built to maximize gape while maximizing um, uh, bite force, or maintaining bite force. Okay, so in thinking about um, in thinking about what they killed, we presume, we know from studies of modern animals that there's this general relationship that as predator body size goes up, prey body size goes up as well. And in general, what happens is an animal gets larger, say lions, larger than leopards, they can take a wider range of prey because they can move farther up the size scale than, say, a leopard can. So there are advantages to getting large because you're increasing, in some sense, the range of prey that you can take. So small cats, like bobcats, eat prey that are much smaller than themselves, rodents, rabbits, and things like that. Big cats cross over and start eating prey that's as large or larger than themselves. So given that Smilodon's a big cat, so we know it ate large prey, but it's added muscularity and forelimbs, et cetera, and canines suggest that it ate even larger prey for its body size than lions would have. And if we look at Rancho La Brea, since it's a, got a great fossil record, at Rancho La Brea, these would have been the animals that Smilodon ate. So camels, not this little guy, but big camels, horses, mammoths, mastodons, and bison. And there are isotopic studies that indicate that they did take all of these things, but they had some preference for bison. So how did they kill these big things? That's the next question. Okay, to figure this out, let's look at the killing tools. So we have, this is a lion in front view and a smilodon, massive canine, uh, incisors rather, relative to the African lion, and of course these elongate um, blades, flattened canine teeth, as opposed to relatively peg-like uh, short canine teeth in the lion. We know from studies of living carnivores that canine tooth size is um, indicative of killing behavior. So for example, um, cats have relatively round, like the lion, peg-like canines, whereas dogs, all canid species, have relatively narrow uh, from side to side, more knife-like canines, as illustrated there. And this relates to how these animals kill. They kill differently, right? So cats, big cats, use a single strong bite to kill their prey. And they often, except in the case of lions, are hunting alone, so they're taking on a rather dangerous task. They usually will use either, in this case, a throat hole, where they're simply holding the trachea shut, and they're not necessarily even breaking the skin, and will suffocate the animal, so this takes considerable time, but they're not really cutting through the skin. And same here, what you see this lion doing, looks like he's giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but he's not. He's covering up, 
he's covering up the nose and the mouth of that buffalo and holding it until the animal suffocates and dies. And that looks like what this one is trying to do as well. So when they're making these bites like this or trying to get a hold on their throat, their jaws are closing strongly and they can't really readjust where that bite is going to go too easily. Um, it's a matter of urgency. And so they're likely to encounter bone, especially when they're doing this nose hold, that could potentially break their canines. Also, the prey are struggling and exerting forces on their teeth and their heads when they're um, making this killing bite. Dogs, on the other hand, and this is African wild dogs, but this is the way gray wolves kill as well. They work in groups, as you know. Unlike cats, dogs don't have the ability to grapple their prey. They don't have retractile claws. If they want to take large prey, they generally have to do it using multiple mouths, having a, a social group. And so they come in towards the rear, towards the softer areas of the animal where they're less likely to encounter bone, and use multiple slashing bites until the animal is weakened and falls over, and then they eventually kill it. But they are using um, multiple slashing bites and in a way that is probably minimizing the chance that they're encountering bone. So going back to our diagrams then, cats have canine teeth. Because they're round, that means they're built to resist loads equally in all directions. And that's a good thing if you're making these unpredictable large bites on struggling animals. Whereas canids have teeth that are built to resist loads primarily in the fore and aft direction because they're just coming in, biting, and pulling back. I mean, in biting and pulling back. So they don't need to reinforce their teeth from, for blow, loads that are coming from side to side as much as cats do. So their teeth are much narrower. So what does that say about saber tooth then? Well, here's cross section of saber tooth. This is the crown part of the tooth, the part that we use for killing. And clearly, it's shaped more like dogs than it is like cats. So that tells us that they probably didn't kill the way big cats do. They probably didn't use suffocation or a nose hold or anything like that. They probably used multiple slashing bites to kill their prey, and they probably definitely you know, broke the skin unlike modern lions do today. Now the favored um, hypothesis for how they would have applied this bite is something like this. It's called the canine shear bite, in which they open their jaws quite wide and they hook the lower incisors, which were large, into a side of the flesh here. And then they're going to close the jaws, so they're going to pull the head downwards, as you can see, drawing it through the body. And then once they meet, perhaps with the incisors, then they can just pull back and make a massive wound that presumably incapacitates the animal. And they may have done the two or three or four to um, finish them off. So the question, where would they have applied this sort of bite, do you think? Well, we got all kinds of interesting illustrations, <laughs> hypotheses like, um, back of the neck here, or this one's definitely suicidal going in for <laughs> the thorax, which is you know, full of bones, and plus he's just going to do that, and that would be the end of it, but um, it makes for a dramatic picture, I guess. And then there are, the abdomen is a popular notion that they would have pulled the animal down using their powerful muscular body and then positioned themselves to get them in the soft underbelly. And then, of course, the other one is the throat, using the ventral part of the throat, which is also has a lot of um, important uh, structures that could cause a lot of damage. So to sort through these, given the idea that these saber tooths have these knife-like canines that are going to be vulnerable to fracture because they're extremely long and then narrow from side to side, so a blow to the side will break them. And we know, actually, I should mention this, we know that they did break them. We have them at the tar pits that were clearly they've broken a canine, but they lived with one broken canine. It's polished and worn. And in modern big cats, we know they break their canines all the time. About one out of every four individuals has a broken canine. So that it is a risk. It's something that happens all the time. So given that they have this knife-like shape of their canines, and that they're likely to fracture, they probably tried to avoid hitting bone when they made kills. So I would say the thorax is out, given all those bones right there, the rib cage. I would also not favor the back of the neck, because in this animal, this is the guy with the muscles on it, the vertebrae are running right along the back here. So you're not going to be able to get in very deep without hitting rather um, tough bone and making, possibly breaking your canines. So that leaves us with the abdomen and the throat. Personally, I and I think most of us favor the throat, although I wouldn't deny that they might have done some abdominal kills occasionally. The reason the throat seems so great is because, um, and I learned this when I taught human anatomy, or it came home to me when I taught human anatomy 
um, years ago, is that there's so much in here that's so vulnerable. There's carotid arteries, jugular veins, your trachea, nerves that are running out of your brain down that run, operate your breathing. There's so much there that you really, I mean, it made me feel like I should walk around with a metal collar on all the time. It was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, get away from me. Yeah, but uh, it wouldn't take much at all. Two or three of those big bites and pull backwards and they would have that animal dead very quickly. The abdomen would take longer because you've got to pull them over, you've got to get in the right position. And the other problem is, you know, the ribs come back this far, and then you've got this big thigh in the way. So you've got to kind of, it, it just seems more difficult. So I think they may have done it sometimes. It wouldn't, of course, animals always, there's always variety. But um, I think the preferred, preferred method of attack would have been the throat. And this helps us understand something about why this form evolved repeatedly. This would have been a very quick technique for killing. Much quicker than what I showed you with a lion that can take five minutes or more than that to kill something. And there are advantages to killing something quickly because you're less likely to be injured by what you're killing, so you've got to get it over with before they hurt you. And you're also less likely to attract the attention of other carnivores in the area that might want to steal what you have killed. So if you can do it quickly and silently as possible, and then you have the thing to yourself for as long as possible, there's a big advantage to doing that. So I think this gives us a good clue as to why this form evolved repeatedly. It was because of that advantage of killing quickly, but I'll give you another advantage as well, and avoiding uh, carcass theft to some extent. Okay, so why evolve saber teeth? Well, this would be one idea, and I guess that is why he has saber teeth. I don't know, to climb around on ice, but no. No. Um, because it will allow you to take a wider range of prey sizes, because even if you're the same body size as a round tooth cat, you're more muscular and you've got these huge teeth and you can probably take larger prey. Um, you can kill quickly and minis minimize the chance of injury. And you can better defend kills that you've made or even do the th go steal kills from someone else because you are such a threatening, uh, you have such a threatening appearance and uh, probably it's not false. I mean, you have, these cats have these very massive forequarters and then these very large canine teeth. So we know from um, studies of large carnivores in North America and Africa and elsewhere that Con conflicts over carcasses are fairly common and quite dangerous. And there is, uh, so we would expect to see adaptations like this to enhance your ability to both steal a carcass and defend a carcass. So here's a really nice mural by William Stout that's down in the San Diego Museum showing Smilodon, and notice he has a group of Smilodon, little cubs, defending a kill from an, a bunch of nasty dire wolves. Which brings us to um, sort of my final um, topic was, is, uh, were saber-toothed cats social or were they solitary? So it's hard to infer social behavior or those kinds of behaviors in the fossil record because unless you get something like a preserved herd, and sometimes we do, you know, you get an ash fall in Nebraska 17 million years ago and a whole herd of rhinos was preserved. So then you go, oh, they lived in groups, right? <laughs> you didn't believe it anyway. But that doesn't happen that much with carnivores. We don't see things like that. So we have to take sort of uh, indirect ways um, to do this. And what I'm going to talk about is a recent comparison that we did of, of Rancho La Brea with modern African ecosystems that does suggest that Smilodon, at least, was social. Okay, there are two reasons to think that saber-toothed cats wouldn't have been social in general. The first is that cats you know, are capable of killing things by themselves, and most of them, shown all there, are solitary. So the only truly very social cat that we have is the lion. So it's more conservative to assume that cats in the fossil record were solitary rather than social. The second reason is this peculiar thing about Smilodon anyway, which is one of the only cats for which we know this, or saber tooths for which we know this. We know because we have so many individuals of, like over 1,100 individuals of Smilodon at the tar pits, that they were not sexually dimorphic. Males did not differ from females in size. In the lion is perhaps the most, is the most dimorphic of cats, and that's because the males are huge and they have these manes, and the reason they have those is because they have aggressive male-male competition to take over prides. So selection is favored, having really large, vicious males that can fight with each other and succeed. 
So the fact that Smilodon isn't sexually dimorphic is a little bit puzzling. Now, of course, we have social animals like wolves that aren't sexually dimorphic, but in cats, we sort of expect that. So that's two reasons why not to think it. On the other hand, there are so many Smilodon at La Brea, and second only to the dire wolves, and the dire wolves, everyone assumes, were social because they're wolves, so maybe they were social. And I didn't mention, yes, the fact that those saber-toothed branch on that family tree that split between the cats we have today and the saber tooth branch is about 17 or 20 million years ago. So that's a long time ago. So they haven't been, they could have evolved their own sorts of behaviors that we're not used to. But anyway, here's my interesting way of getting around, of looking at uh, the question of sociality and Smilodon. It's a comparison of what we call playback experiments and the fossil record at Rancho La Brea shown here. So <laughs> playback experiments are done um, to, in Africa, these are what we're going to talk about as ones done in Africa at any rate, where they play the sounds of dying wildebeests or whatever, or the sounds of lions and hyenas squabbling over a kill, and they then wait, they play them for an hour or so, and then they wait to see who comes. And they're using it to try to census the number of lions and hyenas in an area, and it works quite well. And the lions and hyenas will come from over three kilometers away. Um, to this, these sounds. So it's a predator attraction kind of thing. They're doing it to census animals. In the case of the tar pits, and hopefully most of you have kind of been there, so you know the basic scenario, we have this sticky asphalt that comes to the surface, gets quite sticky, some poor hapless herbivore gets stuck, and is in the throes of dying or dies, it attracts carnivores, which then attract other carnivores. So it also is a very similar in the sense that they are predator attraction events. And you get a million bones, as shown there. From, that's a guy sorting Smilodon vertebrae, all those boxes of Smilodon vertebrae. What a job, yeah? OK. So both playbacks in La Brea represent predator attraction events. Now let's look at the playbacks first and see who comes to the playbacks relative to who could come, who's out there on the African landscape. OK, so what we see, there's the punchline. Social species are overrepresented relative to their densities. This graph shows the percentage of the total numbers of individuals that came, and there are many, many animals, these are large sample sizes, um, that came to these uh, playback events. These are two different bars for um, different playback experiments, one in South Africa, one in East Africa, and nicely the results are very similar, suggesting we have a real pattern here. What we've done is we've divided the, all the carnivores out there on the landscape into four categories. Large social, large solitary, small social, and small solitary. And the light blue bar is the numbers of them on the landscape. So over 80 something percent of all the carnivores out there in a given space there in Africa are small solitary species and very few are large social species because of energetics, right? You can't have as many large species in a place as, a small, as small species. But what you can see is it's overwhelmingly, 85% of them are large social species, which are spotted hyenas and lions. And then also the jackals, which are a small social species, are predominant. Large solitary species rarely show up. So leopards and cheetahs rarely come to these things, and cheetahs actively move away from them. It's like, whoa, I'm not getting near there. That's where lions and hyenas are, because cheetahs are killed by these things, so they avoid them. OK, so clearly big social species Lions and hyenas and small social species are overrepresented relative to their numbers. Now, why would that be? Because it's too risky to go alone. When you approach one of these events, a dying animal or the sounds of hyenas and lions squabbling, of course, you know you're coming to something that you may encounter other large carnivores, either of your own species or another species. So there's safety in numbers. You don't do it on your own. A, a single leopard will not approach something like that. Um, because it's just too risky because carnivores kill each other all the time as going on there, right. Okay, and interestingly, just in East Africa, some other, one other social species showed up about 2% of the time at these playbacks, Maasai. <laughs> so the Maasai would come trotting in with their spears and be really pissed off because there'd just be a, you know, a speaker there. <laughs> and, <laughs> And they were coming either to steal from the lions or to drive them off there and hyenas off there, you know, away from their territory, their area of cattle. But they would steal from them as well. Another advantage of our sociality, see, we're using it in the same way. Okay, let's move to the tar pits. So here's Rancho La Brea tar seep somewhere in the middle of there and 15,000 or so years ago. Again, we have a predator attraction event, so we get a very upside down 
distribution of fossils here in the sense that if you look at this pie chart of the mammals, this yellow, all of this is carnivores and the rest, these little slices here, are herbivores. And that's totally upside down to what's on the landscape, right? You should have 10 times or 9 times as many herbivores as you have carnivores. We have the re reverse at Rancho La Brea, which makes it great for me, of course, because I study carnivores, so what a great place. But that clearly shows this is what a paleontologist calls a predator trap. We have other situations like this. The tar seeps are one, and there are tar seeps in Venezuela. There are tar seeps in Peru um, that also show this kind of pattern. And then you can get these um, pitfall cave type things where herbivores would fall into a cave and then uh, you know, a pitfall type cave, a deep cave, and carnivores would go in to eat, feed on them and then couldn't get out as well. So you don't get quite this dramatic number of carnivores that we have at La Brea though, or in percentage as you see here. So when you look at La Brea, as I said, here's Smilodon, the American lion, the short-faced bear, and the dire wolf, and I don't have a picture of the coyote, um, but at any rate, um, the most common is the dire wolf, 1,700 individuals approximately, 1,100 uh, Smilodon, and then uh, smaller numbers of, of the lion, the short-faced bear, and the coyote, a pretty substantial number of coyote. Um, so this pattern is uh, looking suggestive. So two species dominate. It's the um, saber-tooth and the dire wolf. And so if we play a little game here where we assume Smilodon is social, this is the same graph I showed you before without the blue bars for the abundance on the landscape because we can't do that in the fossil record, unfortunately. So the red and the yellow are the African playback experiments, and the gray bar now is La Brea. If we assume Smilodon falls in this category, we get a spot-on match of almost 85% of the individuals being large social. If we, and then we have a predominance of small social too. So this looks pretty nice. If we then say, well, what does it look like if it's solitary? Of course, it looks like a sore thumb where you have this huge bar of large solitary species attending these um, events which are quite dangerous. So they'd have to be behaving very differently from the way leopards, for example, um, behave today. So it's more consistent to think that they were social based on these playback data. In addition, we got one more little piece of evidence which I think is a fairly powerful one. There are juvenile Smilodon at the tar pits, just as in the playback experiments in the lions. Here shown here, this is the percentage of individuals that are either juveniles or adults. You can see about a third of the lions that came to playbacks were cubs, and they were always accompanied by a minimum of two and a maximum of seven, an average of four adults. So obviously cubs didn't come alone, but they also didn't come with just one adult. They always came with two adults. So, and clearly that's a very risky thing to bring your cubs to some uh, event like this and when you're going to encounter other species potentially, but lions can do it because they're big and they're social. So here's Smilodon, um, also of almost the same percentage, and then these three species, the dire wolf, the coyote, and the American lion, which we assume are social, also show, have cubs or pups. They brought them to the tar pits, whereas the short-faced bear, only one of 33 individuals was a young animal, and it was a sub-adult, wasn't really a juvenile. So. So that's consistent with solitary species not bringing their um, young to such events. Okay, so you combine that fact of these juveniles coming with their parents, presumably, and the overwhelming abundance of Smilodon at the tar pits, um, I think it strongly suggests that they were social. Okay, I'm amazed, I'm already. So I hope that I've entertained you for about an hour or less, and hope that you now realize, if you did not before, that the saber-toothed cat-like form was not a rare freak. Instead, it's a highly successful predator that evolved repeatedly at least five times over the past 50 million years. And they're a fabulous example of convergent evolution in which similar selective forces mold animals of similar design through the action of evolution by natural selection. And given all the new tools that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot more about saber-toothed cats over the coming decades, and um, I look forward to being part of that. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Do you have somebody to... Is there...